So welcome everyone, I'm uh, Rachel Clark. I'm based in Newcastle upon Tyne. And I am super excited to announce our keynotes and introduce our keynote today, our final keynote of the online part of the Participatory Design Conference. Um, so our keynote is Catherine Dignazio and her talk today is on co-design, data feminism and counter data science. So before I introduce Catherine properly, I'll just do a brief um, acknowledgement of country, um, which I've had to do several times for this conference and I, yeah, it's kind of interesting to do one each time. Um, so I give thanks to the stewards of the land past and present in the borderlands of North East England in Northumberland, where I'm based today and now call home. I acknowledge my privilege benefiting from the labour woven in Manchester with threads of the cotton industry running through my veins. The mill workers and the revolutionaries who fought for their rights and education in the industrialised North. The wealth, slavery and exploitation created by this industry across the continents has laid foundations for textile crafts which ground my roots in the North. Thank you. And so if I can introduce Catherine now as, oh, sorry, I need to do my guidelines, sorry, just to set the tone for the session. Um, so we've put these together just as something that we developed in 2020 based on um, ways of being together online. So we'd like to ask that you be kind and mindful of differences of any kind and be patient with technical constraints and hiccups, which we have a few. Enter our spaces to listen deeply and participate with respect. Please mute your, mute your microphone during the sessions and avoid interrupting the presentation in progress by distracting other attendees. Please do be careful in your choice of words and endeavour to make your expressions and languages inclusive. Please do not judge or trivialise others and phrase any critiques respectfully with constructive advice. Please also avoid generalisations as much as possible by anchoring your perspectives in direct experiences or personal observation. So session chairs, um, we, we are recording the session which starts as soon as you enter the room. If you wish to be anonymous, please turn your camera off and de-identify yourself on Zoom. And we invite you to acknowledge the traditional custodians and lands from where you are attending in the Zoom chat box, which we've had some lovely ones here today. So on that note, I it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Catherine Dignazio. So which I've known Catherine's work for quite a while. Um, and so it's it's really exciting to be able to invite her to PDC and for her to present um, her latest work. Um, so she was just saying that this is part of a chapter for a new book which is uh, to come out, we were, I don't know when, I'll let, <laughs> let you explain when, um, with all the complexities of writing books. Um, but I'll just give a brief overview of Catherine's um, brilliant work. So she's a, an Associate Professor of Urban Science and Planning in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. She's a scholar, artist, designer and hacker mama who focuses on feminist technology and data justice. She has run reproductive justice hackathons, designed global news recommendation systems, and created talking and tweeting water quality sculptures. With Rahul Balgava, she built the platform DataBasic.io, a suite of tools and activities to introduce newcomers to data science. Her 2020 book from MIT Press, Data Feminism, co-authored with Lauren Klein, charts a course for more ethical and empowering data science practices. Since 2019, she has co-organised Data Against Femini Feminicide, a participatory action research design project will, with Silvana Fumiga and Helena Suarez Val. De Ignacio is an associate prefer. Oh, we've already said that. So <laughs> she's also director of the Data Feminism Lab, which uses data and computational methods to work towards gender and racial e equity particularly in relation to space and place. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Catherine. And the floor is yours. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, 
to Rachel, to Yoko, to John, to everyone who's organizing the event and who invited me. Um, super honored to be here, um, have followed the Participatory Design Conference for some time. So it's just totally an honor to, to be a keynote here. Um, I am going to share my screen. Okay. And sorry, I'm just gonna start a timer. I haven't, you know, full disclosures, I haven't given this talk before, so this is new work. And so just wanna make sure that I don't go too far over time. Um, so yeah, thank you, Rachel, for that lovely introduction. And uh, today I'm gonna give a sort of a first person report from this sort of large and sort of messy um, participatory action research design project in which we're using the principles of data feminism to co-design technology with data activists. Um, and when I say we, the we in question here is uh, Silvana Fumega, Elena Suarez-Val and myself, and I'll introduce them um, in just a minute. Um, so I, I appreciate that you all are doing land acknowledgements as part of this conference and that you're uh, sort of institutionalizing that. Um, I wanted to offer our own land acknowledgement from the context of MIT as an institution with the caveat <laughs> that MIT actually does not have an official land acknowledgement because unlike its peer institutions in the area, it has not engaged with local indigenous people uh, to come up with uh, one that is acceptable to all of them. So the one that we work with at MIT is sort of cobbled together from a variety of different kind of processes and local contexts. Um, and I am hopeful that MIT will be able to actually engage with local indigenous communities to, to develop a land acknowledgement. Um, but so I'm coming to you today from the traditional unceded territories of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people. Um, we acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of these territories, as well as the ongoing processes of colonialism and dispossession. Um, and MIT has played a particular role in that dispossession. One of our uh, presidents uh, was one of the architects of the American Indian Reservation System, for example. Um, and another interesting thing, you know, that we need to acknowledge from the MIT institutional perspective is that not only does MIT sit on stolen land, but it also is a land grant university and profited um, from the sale of lands sort of far away physically. So um, these are lands that were sold or granted as part of the Morrill Act, which was in the 1860s. Um, and so MIT actually benefited from the the stealing of land that's you know in present day Oklahoma. So sort of like um, the middle part of the United States, which belong to the Greater and Little Osage, the Chippewa and Omaha peoples. Um, so within our own department, we've tried to um, seek, this is a part we've added from our department. So we try to seek to indigenize our institution, the field of planning, uh, to offer space, to admit more native students, to hire more indigenous faculty, and work together towards the visionary and power shifting project of decolonization, which is land back. Um, and so land acknowledgements are at least one, you know, initial step in doing that um, and one way to start to tell our institution to become accountable. So, um, so as we get started, I, this is like kind of the one question that I'm using to frame the talk. Uh, what does it look like to co-design technology in the service of liberation? And um, the spoiler alert for this question is that I am not gonna answer it. <laughs> so uh, we'll come back to it, but um, but um, I'm actually not gonna answer it, but I'm going to model a way of, of starting towards answering it, I guess. Um, so what does it look like to co-design technology in the service of liberation? Um, I want to start with something it doesn't look like because sometimes I think it's really helpful to do like what what it's not uh, before we can figure out what something does look like. Um, and so this is a fictional story. Uh, this is like a hypothetical write up 
about the design project I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, but it's like maybe the way that Wired Magazine would cover it. So it's the way that um, it would be covered in a kind of like splashy sort of techno boosterist uh, sort of context. Um, so MIT professor uses AI to solve gender violence. MIT professor Catherine has developed an advanced automated system using artificial intelligence and machine learning to sift through massive amounts of news and social media data to detect feminicide, the gender related killings of women and girls. Based at MIT, her project creates a centralized and comprehensive global archive of feminicide at a scale never before seen. According to Dignasio, the machine learning classifier she trained can detect news articles about feminicide with an accuracy of 92%. So what's wrong with this? I mean, I, I'm sure you all can see many problems <laughs> with this fictional hero story that I've just told you. Um, so what, let's like just go through some of the things that are happening here. Um, so this hypothetical system that I built uh, it's sophisticated from a technical perspective. Uh, the database is large. Uh, it's in fact massive. It's comprehensive. It's framed as an authoritative central repository. Um, this project, the way it's framed, it's credited to me individually uh, and my affiliation with MIT, an elite institution is mentioned several times. And so I think it's important to interrogate stories like this because they are so frequent. They might not be as kind of blatant as this, but um, I think it's important to interrogate these kinds of hero stories um, and to think about who these hero stories uh, work well for. Um, so a hero story like this works well for me. It works well for my own social capital. Uh, as an academic, I'm incentivized towards individual achievement uh, tenure committees are kind of suspicious of collaboration. Um, this story works well for my institution. Uh, so, and MIT is, you know, quote unquote, solving uh, gender related violence. Um, this story works well for funders who want to invest in efficient and scalable technologies rather than investing in people and in relations. The story works well for white supremacy, uh, as well as settler colonialism, patriarchy, and imperialism, because it reinforces this sort of white saviorism, right? So both from a benevolent white individual, myself, and from a white dominated institution. Um, and so that's sort of who this is working well for. But then it's also important to think about when we encounter these kind of hero stories, what does, what do they erase and exclude? Um, and it erases, the story erases and excludes some of the things that I wanna spend the rest of the presentation talking about. Uh, so first of all, erasing the labor of the women-led and indigenous-led and queer-led groups that are doing data activism around feminicide. Um, it erases the agency of families, communities, and social movements that are at the heart of anti-feminicide activism, not just the data part, but all of the anti-feminicide activism. Um, and it, it hides the technological and social complexities of actually trying to monitor feminicide across cultures, geographies, language, race, ethnicity, class, and so on. <clears throat> Um, so let me tell you more, a little bit more about fe feminicide data activism. Um, my first encounter with data activists in this space was through the work of Maria Salguero, uh, who monitors feminicide in Mexico. And she's here on the bottom right of this slide. Um, so feminicides are gender related killings of women and girls. Uh, and they include cis and trans women. Um, the feminicide is de legally defined as a crime across Latin America. So in 18 countries, that's almost all of Latin America, uh, there are laws on the books uh, defining and criminalizing feminicide, um, largely thanks to the strength of the Latin American feminist movement uh, in sort of getting those laws passed. Um, and this includes in Mexico where Mar Maria Salguero is based. So there's, there is a law on the books about feminicide in Mexico. 
Um, and yet the state does not uh, systematically collect data on feminicide. So sort of like the laws exist, but the implementation, like uh, measurement and implementation um, is uh, severely lacking. Um, and you can kind of follow along with this public conversation if you go look at the hashtag ni una menos, which is, uh, means not one less woman, basically. Um, and so Maria Salguero was uh, frustrated by this lack of action and this, this, this kind of like gap in implementation and the sort of impunity that surrounded gender-based violence. Um, and so she resolved to sort of head straight towards this problem and collect this data herself. Um, and so she's been doing this for um, almost seven years. Um, and in the process, has single-handedly compiled the largest public archive of feminicide in the Mexican context. Um, this is not easy work. Um, the way this work is done is extremely manually. So she spends around two to four hours a day uh, reading uh, media reports about uh, really brutal violence uh, and then logging these into her database and then ultimately onto the, the Google Maps that you see here. Um, and actually now that she's gotten a lot of attention um, and her work has been featured in a number of different places, she's actually become quite well known. And so she has a really extensive network of people who give her tips. Um, and so people who are like sending her via WhatsApp or emails or what have you, um, tips about different things or links to news articles, um, which she then follows up with by copying and pasting details into her database. Um, and so using her data, she's helped families locate loved ones who have gone missing. Uh, she provides her data to journalists and NGOs and researchers. Um, she's been called to testify in front of Mexico's Congress uh, multiple times. Um, and so this is a form of what you might call and in what in fact Lauren Klein and I and Data Feminism call feminist counter data. So it's a kind of an activist data collection that steps in when the state and other institutions have systematically failed to ensure the basic safety of their population. Um, and so it represents one way to use data to challenge power. And that's sort of how we talk about it in data feminism. And there's like kind of an important caveat, I won't go too far into it, but we could get into a conversation of like, um, you know, when is it appropriate to collect counter data? Because it's not always appropriate to collect, like, you know, the answer to any given problem of uh, inequality is not like go collect more data. <laughs> but we can get, we can, we can get into to those nuances. Um, so while Maria's work has gotten a lot of media attention, um, there are in fact many grassroots efforts um, like her project that use very similar methods to the ones that she's using. Um, uh, our collaborative research team that I'm going to tell you about in just a second. Um, so we've cataloged more than 150 of these kind of data activism projects around the world who are doing this work. Um, the majority of these are located in Latin America where the conversation about feminicide is um, really strong and vibrant and it's really kind of um, the feminist movement there has really put this on the public agenda. Um, but there are also efforts from a lot of other um, global locations around the world and the, the area of interest for our research project is the Americas broadly so North South Central America. Um, and then some of these uh, projects that monitor gender related violence um, monitor specific forms of racialized feminicide like the Sovereign Bodies Institute, who monitors missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and two-spirit people, um, or there's the group Data Labe in Brazil, uh, which uh, they documented cases of transgender violence. So while I was on sabbatical, um, so I went on a sabbatical in Argentina in 2019, um, and I met these awesome people that you see here uh, who have now become collaborators and friends on this sort of sprawling project. Um, Elena Suarez Val is a doctoral student at the um, Center for Interdisciplinary Methodologies at the University of Warwick. Um, she's also the founder and main person behind the data activism project Feminicidio Uruguay, um, which does work similar to Maria's, but in the context of Uruguay. Um, Silvana Fumega is the, uh, the director of research of the Latin American Initiative for Open Data. Um, which is a regional organization 
um, that works on open data and has in fact developed a, a data standard around um, <clears throat> how feminicide data should be collected. And just a minute to acknowledge, like this is uh, kind of a large project. We have lots of uh, partners and student researchers and staff from ILDA who are who are behind a lot of this work. So, um, so the project has three pillars, um, and mainly I'm going to talk to you about the first two today. Um, but first of all, we're a qualitative research project, so we want to understand how activists do their work. We want to we want to understand their data and information practices. Um, secondly, we're a participatory design project, so we're designing tools to support activists, which I'm going to tell you about. Um, and then finally, we're a global uh, community of practice. We have events and convenings where we bring folks together who do this work so they can share information. So we started this project as I was revising data feminism. Um, so this is a co-author book with Lauren Klein that came out in 2020. Um, if you don't know Lauren's work, I strongly encourage you to go check out her work, follow her. She has a fantastic lab called the Digital Humanities Lab, and she's based at Emory University. Um, and so in data feminism, Lauren and I tried to outline what an intersectional feminist approach to data science might look like. And we outlined seven principles um, for working towards feminist data science. Um, the book is structured this way, so like each chapter describes one of these principles. Um, in each chapter, we introduce readers to the feminist thinkers that are kind of behind that principle. And then we try to show examples of um, people who are working in the world with data um, in ways that embody that principle. Um, but as probably all of you in this community know, and as all I think practitioners know, uh, practice is messy <laughs> and participatory projects are messy. Uh, real life does not always adhere super cleanly to these nice principles. Um, so as Silvana and Elena and I were starting off on the Data Against Feminicide project, this seemed to be an opportunity to try to see how can we use these principles in practice. Um, and so from here, I wanna describe some of our participatory design uh, activities and how we tried to use data feminism as these kind of guideposts for, for making decisions, but also some of the tensions and questions that arose in the process and are still present and are not necessarily resolvable with principles. <laughs> so, um, uh, so first, the, the first part was the uh, qualitative, this is actually ongoing work, but, um, but we'd started this part before we started the design side of it. Because <clears throat> um, this really formed the backbone for us understanding data activism practices of these um, anti-feminicide groups. Um, so to date, we've interviewed 35 groups who do this work. We've asked participants about their motivations for doing the work, their definitions of feminicide, their sources of information, how they research and find information, the software they use, their categories that they apply to feminicide, um, their labor, and including um, very strong uh, themes that have emerged around the emotional labor involved in, in doing this kind of work. Um, and so we've recently finally published a paper. <laughs> Actually, it took us a while <laughs> to publish this paper uh, from several rejections in many different venues. <laughs> so, but we, get, we did it. it it's out. Um, so you can learn about some of the themes that we um, kind of highlight. So activists have kind of a three-stage workflow that involves researching cases, recording cases into these kind of more structured formats, um, and then really thinking about their spreadsheets and databases as spaces of memory, uh, memory justice, and memorialization. <clears throat> so you can go uh, uh, read this work. It's an open access article. Um, and one of the main findings from the more qualitative side of that work is that Activists are enacting a kind of alternative epistemological approach to data science. Um, and it's an approach that centers care and memory and justice. Um, and this is very aligned with work that's talked about this by Paula Ricarte. Um, and so she says, data activism practices around feminicide configure a form of epistemic disobedience against the extractivist and colonial logics that govern hegemonic data science. Um, and just a shout out here, folks that work with data might be interested in the Tierra Común network that Paula is a founder of, um, where they're working 
um, really hard on themes around uh, decolonizing data. Um, so this is kind of like the counter data science enacted by these activists. Um, but here's where we went in terms of the design side of things. So we kind of drew on what we were learning as we were interviewing groups. Um, and we engaged in a participatory design process where we worked really closely with two groups for six months, uh, Women Count USA and Fe Feministerio Uruguay, Elena's group. Um, and kind of iterated with them in a very open way of like kind of what tools would be useful for you? What tools would help you do the work that you're doing to monitor and scan our news articles and put them in databases and so on. Um, and from that process, um, we developed two tools that we then piloted with groups in the US um, and in Argentina and Uruguay. <clears throat> and so I'll tell you about the two tools. Um, so the first that came out was a um, tool called the Data Highlighter. Uh, this is a pretty simple uh, browser extension for the Chrome browser. Um, and so the sort of use case that this is designed for is the stage of work when activists are, um, have they have found a relevant news article that describes a case of feminicide. Um, and often what they'll do is they, they read the article and any salient details such as like name, date, uh, weapon, place, uh, and so on, they usually kind of copy and paste into their spreadsheet or database where they, they used to track these cases. Um, and so this is designed for the scenario of facilitating easy reading and scanning of these articles. Um, and so the data highlighter simply highlights uh, names, uh, places, and dates, um, as well as custom words that folks can put in. So often, Activists are looking for, you know, key determining element as to whether something constitutes a feminicide is the relationship between the um, perpetrator and the victim. Um, so often in the custom words box, they'll put in relationship words like um, husband or family member or pa partner or ex or something like that um, to facilitate this kind of scanning. Um, there's a couple other features, but that's that's the basic idea of it. Um, the second tool that we designed and piloted is this tool, the email alerts tool. So if anyone here has ever used Google alerts, uh, it's like really similar to Google alerts. <laughs> it's like the same idea. Um, this basic idea that um, the tool on the back end uh, each day is going out and scanning a wide variety of media sources, um, looking for articles that are relevant to that activist's project. Um, when it finds articles that meet those criteria, uh, it actually runs them through a um, machine learning model uh, that we trained to try to evaluate uh, the likelihood that this particular news article describes a case of feminicide. And if it meets a certain threshold, it gets delivered to activists as a both an email alert and then what you see here, this is like the dashboard for the system where it's sending um, possibly relevant articles um, to the activists um, for then their determination of whether this constitutes a feminicide and or a case that's relevant for their databases because not everybody is monitoring sort of feminicide. They have sometimes groups have more kind of specific forms of violence that they're looking at. Um, and see what else I want to say about this. Um, Sorry, this is a little bit probably overly technical, um, but this is basically like the idea is that activists put in a query, they make a project and they put in a query. The system, we're partnered with this uh, media cloud database, which this is relevant because I'm going to come back to this as attention. Um, but uh, so this is a, a big data uh, archive um, that has really extensive collections of geographic media. So we can, you know, an activist group in Argentina can monitor all, or all, but a lot of Argentina media. Um, and that's what the system scans. Relevant news articles get passed through these classifiers in different languages and then get delivered back to the activists either in their inbox or in the dashboard, depending on how they're looking at the tool. Um, okay. So coming back to the principles of data feminism, I wanted to explain a little bit about how these played a role in our design process and our decision-making. Um, so 
state of feminism, the principle of embracing pluralism says that the most complete knowledge comes from synthesizing multiple perspectives with priority given to local, indigenous, and experiential ways of knowing. Um, and so for us, what this meant was designing counter data collection tools in collaboration, coalition, and solidarity with the people who are already doing the work. Um, so really thinking about like, how can we um, support many people who are doing this work, you know, encounter to that hero story that I was saying at the beginning, like, how can we not like suck up the activist data and centralize it ourselves for our own expert analysis, but how do we undergird the work that's already happening and being done by the folks who are already the experts. Um, and on each of these slides, I'm not going to have time to go into all these connections, but on each of these slides, I'm um, pointing to some of the literature that was relevant for um, this case study that I talk about a little more in the book that I'm writing right now. So this is a fantastic paper, um, which is about some of these um, aspects of like kind of how do we work in solidarity from the position of academia. Um, Data feminism also teaches us to value multiple forms of knowledge, um, including the knowledge that comes from people as living and feeling beings in the world. Um, so here I think about how do we elevate emotion and embodiment. Um, at each stage of this process, we've talked about um, how can we foster caring relations. Um, so this, uh, Maria Puig de la Bella Casa is um, actually Elena's advisor and has been very influential for her. Um, and this idea of how can we uh, care for our, ourselves who are doing the work, um, also for the existing community of practice, um, and also sort of uh, really valuing and designing around the emotional labor side of this work. Um, it's like a really prevalent theme that emerged in our work and both like sort of how do we reduce the amount of emotional labor uh, that activists um, engage with, but also not erase it. Um, like one of the interesting things that came out as we were working on these machine learning models is how much should we be automating things? And when we said, well, like when we said that, like, let's maybe talk about automating everything and just dump the cases into a database and activists really pushed back on that and said, no, in fact, the emotional labor for us is a form of witnessing and it's a form of memory justice. And it's, that's not, desirable for us to like kind of like cleave that part off uh, and automate them. Um, so yeah, one of the main kind of tenets of data feminism is challenging power. So committing to challenging unequal power structures and working towards justice. Um, often I think about this as I, like, it always comes back to the money. <laughs> like, uh, so I, I'm often thinking about like, how do we re-engineer flows of social and financial capital? Like that to me, is how we challenge power. Uh, it was like redirecting, diverting uh, flows of social and financial capital. Um, for us, that meant avoiding large grants, uh, especially at the early stages of this project where we're trying to figure out like, what are, what are we even doing? Like, what are we building? We don't know. Um, and so avoiding that because they create urgency, they create all these deliverables and reporting requirements um, and trying to secure more flexible funds for the work. Um, and then also like paying people for their time. But this was a project where we're like interviewing people from a wide variety of countries and it turned out to be incredibly difficult. Uh, it turned out to be incredibly difficult to pay people around the world. So I'm showing you some of the uh, different ways that we had to figure out to pay people. <laughs> so, um, And then finally, uh, the work of data science, like all work is the work of many hands. So thinking about how do we make labor visible so that it can be recognized and valued. Um, and one of the things we did here was again, not using or centralizing activist data. So just to be really clear, like this is not a project that's about like um, academic people go to activists and ask them for their data and then the academics analyze it. That's not the mode of operation. Um, instead, we're saying, how do we support and sustain the labor that you're already doing? Um, but so we don't use activists data and, and have never asked for it. Um, and so I think this really resonates with the, there's design justice network principles that this really resonates with. So looking towards what is already working at the community level. So thinking about how do you like in the design process, not like disrupt or extract, um, but how do you support an infrastructure what's already there? 
Um, okay, I'm really I'm coming close to time, and I'm gonna so I'm gonna try to do these a little bit fast. But I feel like for me, they're the most interesting part of this talk because they're the they're the places where like the principles and the practice uh, collide. Um, so first of all, so we have three tensions I want to tell you about. So uh, first of all, um, using computation and design for politically contested concepts. Feminicide is not an agreed upon concept in any world. Activists don't agree on what the definition is. Scholars don't agree. Um, governments and laws don't agree. Um, and But everyone has, there, there are things where people get aligned. There are things where places where folks harmonize through dialogue, but there is um, not currently like a standard, one standard definition. Um, groups are also monitoring different geographies. Those geographies have different media ecologies, like feminicide might be discussed in one way in say the Argentine media, but um, either not mentioned or discussed in a very different way in say Peruvian media. Um, so this is this a kind of level of complexity here. Um, and so, you know, one of the main benefits often as talked about with computation is that it works as a kind of a formalizer. It centralizes and it formalizes. Um, but in fact, that's exactly like not what we wanted to do. <laughs> so we needed to try to think about how do we use computation and design to support multiplicity and pluralism of these kinds of practices because formalizing would be extremely premature if like the humans of the world don't agree about this concept. Um, so the way that we navigated this was by, again, not automating, again, like leaving um, many of the kind of decision points um, to the activists themselves, so to the human judgment. Um, and in this way, we tried to support multiple definitions of the concept of feminicide um, and so on. However, um, you know, there's still a bunch of open questions we have about whether our machine learning models are open and flexible enough to detect those cases that uh, the activists care about the most. Um, second tension I want to discuss surfaced in the pilot phase, um, and it's epitomized by this quote. So um, a staff person from Sovereign Bodies, which monitors missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, she said, it's not working for us. We are getting so many cases every day, but we check every single one, and none of them are Indigenous women. Um, and so that was one of the main takeaways um, for Group for from the pilot is that for groups that monitor feminicide kind of broadly, the tool worked quite well. Um, but for groups that monitored racialized forms of such violence, like MMIW or like Black women killed in police violence, is a type of violence one group monitors. Um, they did not work well, and in fact, really didn't work at all. It in fact, increased their their monitoring labor burden. Um, and so there's a bunch of reasons for this. Um, so there's systemic racialized media reporting bias. Um, lots of research has demonstrated how, uh, you know, missing white women become kind of a media spectacle. Uh, if you're from the US, you probably remember the case last year of Gabby Petito, which was kind of this like crazy media firestorm of a, a missing white woman. Um, many other deaths of, of racialized women go unreported. Um, there's also a lot of racial misclassification for indigenous folks specifically um, and more. So there's like a lot of sort of these um, systematic uh, information inequalities in the information ecosystem. Um, and so we realized from this that like our this like default feminicide model was just not gonna work for these groups. Um, and so we needed to figure out how we could design custom machine learning models for these more specific forms of violence. Um, and so this is a tension we're still navigating and we are still testing whether the approach that we developed is um, going to work for these groups or not. Um, and there's a paper uh, written by Harini Suresh and Raj Mova um, about a, a kind of alternative approach um, to, to working, uh, creating models that work for these groups. Um, so, so far these, what we've done seems to be a better step, but the real test will be when we evaluate it with groups themselves. And that'll be like this year, maybe in the fall or maybe in the spring. Um, and then the final tension I wanna raise around this is this one. Um, this is, a, it's a struggle for academic projects to create and support and maintain tools that are useful in the real world. <laughs> so, um, and I'll just tell you a quick story that illustrates this for, the, for our tools. Um, so this was January of this year. Um, the email alert system was like in a pretty good place. We 
fixed bugs that came out of the pilot. We added some new recommendations for features that came out of the pilot. Um, we did a public event with the community and announced it to like the broader data against the Minnesota community. And there are around 30 monitoring projects in the system uh, that were being used by activists and nonprofits and, and artist collectives. Um, and then the system went down. Um, and then the system went down and it didn't come back for two months. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, it, in fact, it wasn't our system, it was the media cloud system, which was facing its own infrastructure problems and um, lack of technical staff on their side of things. Um, but this was our main source of news articles. So we really had no other kind of big data database of news articles to switch in. So our email alert tool just basically couldn't function. Um, and so activists were asking us, especially the ones who participate in the pilot who had come to like really, you know, use these tools. They're like, when are you, <laughs> like, when's this tool coming back? I this tool is useful to me. Um, is, when is this gonna, when is this gonna come back? Um, and so for me, this represents uh, some real systemic problems with building tools from academia. Um, so first of all, in academia, also in funding generally, uh, we incentivize novelty and kind of originality and newness. Um, so academics always have more incentives to make a new thing rather than to maintain an infrastructure and existing system. Um, so we're always like making these prototype, like prototype, 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 um, and never thinking about the design of what happens later. You know, what's the design of the maintenance and infrastructure that will actually lead to something to be useful and, and sustainable. Um, so how do we kind of apply the, that for those kind of design skills to that more infrastructural and maintenance uh, stage? Um, but then we come back to money, uh, like many things come back to money. Um, and I really appreciated in this paper uh, by Shachita Goshal, um, they write about some of the practical challenges of making technology that's useful and workable for grassroots groups. And they talk about you know, for movements, it's often like they are, they're often using the most centralized, but also most available technologies, like things made by Google and Facebook and so on. Um, and so uh, because they're available, they're free um, and they're infrastructure pretty well, right? Like, you know, we, we most of, we, most of us like rely on uh, Google Docs in some fashion or another, Google spreadsheets and so on. Um, but then at that, at that point, then the bar is really high for infrastructure, right? Because then who among us, uh, folks trying to design alternative approaches to design and technology could get off the ground um, for uh, like who of us could ensure uptime and infrastructural soundness if we're not like Facebook and Google. Um, and so I, for me, this is a kind of a tension because like the scale of needing to do that or the, the, the weight of needing to do that um, presents a real, a real barrier for, for developing alternative approaches. Um, so I don't really have an answer to that one. Um, I'm kind of just sitting with these tensions. Uh, we did develop a workaround so that the alerts are back. Actually, Media Cloud is back. We developed a kind of redundancy workaround so that if Media Cloud went down in the future, it would solve it. But like, it still doesn't, um, it doesn't necessarily solve these infrastructure questions. So um, I'm thinking about like alternative models for, for ways to build tools and to scale and deliver those tools. Um, and I wanna say I'm still entertaining the idea that the tools that we created should not exist. <laughs> like, do they need to exist? And I think that's a really important question for all of us to keep on the table as designers, you know, even though we probably love our, our designs and our tools and our processes, but um, at a certain point, we also need to be open to like the idea that maybe it's not the right thing for this context or this world. Um, so I'll end with the question I started with. Um, I don't think I answered it, <laughs> but, but I wanted to show you at least what it doesn't look like to co-design technology in the service of liberation. Uh, I've offered you a, a kind of anti-hero story um, hopefully modeled a process of collaborative and reflective questioning um, and of care and accountability um, that gets us like a little bit closer <laughs> to having an answer, um, but it's still kind of far. So um, thank you so much uh, for the time and the attention. Here's ways to get in touch. Here's the URLs for the um, various projects I've talked about. And thank you. And I look forward to being in dialogue with you all.
Thanks so much, Catherine. Sorry, it's, it, it must feel so weird when you're online and <laughs> there's a sea of people here listening, but <laughs> you're in your little island. Um, that was fantastic to hear the, I guess we've, <laughs> we've all been very much influenced by, uh, you know, reading and, and kind of finding ways to do data feminism and what it looks like uh, for, for all our projects. Um, and I think I said to her when I was getting in touch with Catherine uh, the other day, I was I was, you know, sat next to somebody who was giving uh, a seminar, uh, Marion, who's in the chat, um, who was, you know, st talking about um, Catherine's work. So um, it's fantastic to see those kind of tensions as well and not overlook them because we I think when we're writing papers, they sometimes disappear because we we don't have the space to write about them. Um, so thank you. So there's a few questions. Uh, if if people will allow, I'd just like to. Me and Catherine just had a bit of a uh, chat before <laughs> when you, well Wednesday. Um, it wasn't as long a chat as we hoped, but um, about one of the things. And I was talking to a colleague as well, Carol, about some of these tensions as well. So one of the um, questions that I've got uh, is is around that labour, and um, you know how some of the work that you're uh, the activists are, you know, trawling through stories that are quite um, traumatic or traumatizing or triggering for for some of the um, for some of the activists, um, and how you've also been introducing some of your students to this work and how you how you deal with 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 that um, that form of labour that's important because what you were saying in the in the talk this is an important part of it but it has to be um managed with care um and so yeah so i just wondered whether you could talk a little bit about that absolutely yeah i think that's a hugely important part of the the work that uh the activists do um and in a second um i'm going to put in the chat there's a link to a blog post that we uh wrote about this work um this is an area that elena in particular has been thinking a lot about um the blog post that uh she led was around what are activist uh, strategies for both self-care and team care um because they all have strategies um for the ways that they take care of themselves and and their colleagues if they're doing the work collaboratively um and it's one of those things where um, we, my I myself, um, and then with students have had to also develop some capacity around thinking about this idea of sort of secondary research trauma, um, because it can be quite shocking, even just in the context, like we're not, <clears throat> we don't work directly with families, we were working directly with activists. Um, but we end up even just in the context of say building that tool, the email alerts tool, we're looking at the headlines, we're often reading articles. Um, when we were doing some of the training of the uh, machine learning classifiers, uh, we ourselves are doing some of the data annotation, which involves reading the stories and classifying whether they're, they can't they describe feminicide or not. Um, and so I think it's um, it's been a journey and had to make space uh, for ourselves as a research team to talk about these things. Um, also, like give a little bit of a warning to folks who come on to the project, um, like just that of what the content entails and also that at any point they can step away and do something else <laughs> as part of their work. So they're not in any way um, bound to be um working like specifically with um the data around the news stories um I, I think on the flip side many students have enjoyed the interview process with activists because it can be really inspiring to hear about um what they're doing and how their data have been used and where their data have gone on to have impact and that can be really motivating and inspiring so that kind of um provides a, a, a counter force to just the like repeated stories of, of um, violence. But yeah, and, I, and I, I'm not sure I totally said it in the talk, but um, one of the kind of main goals of that email alerts tool was one of the design goals was thinking about how do we reduce the amount of um, 
irrelevant violent stories that activists are exposed to. So like they do want to see those stories that describe feminicide, but they do not need to see stories that also describe violence, but that might describe other forms of violence that don't match. So um, that was one of the design goals. Can we like lessen the burden at least a little bit by trying to exclude some of that material from their view? Yeah. Yeah, and and some of the people in in the chat and here as well will resonate with you know some of those things that you're saying as well, and and, and caring for each other and as part of that um, as part of that labour. Um, so thank you. So we've got um, a few questions um, that I'll go through. We'll get through as many as we can if possible. Um, so we've um, we've got Lexi. Um, and I wonder whether actually, Lexi, you want to ask your question rather than me. <laughs> I can. I think we can. We can switch your mic on. I think. Uh, let me do a. I think. Unfortunately. Oh, it, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Lexi. Woo. Hi. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Catherine. Um, I'll try and remember the question because I wrote it probably twenty minutes ago. Yeah, but... yeah, it's still in the chat. So if you, uh, sorry, not in the chat in the in the Q and A. <laughs> um, yeah. So Catherine, um, thank you so much for kind of just going through that detailed process. I think you know for people who are interested in exploring participatory design, just hearing you go through that step by step approach was very helpful. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about those seven principles and how you kind of first came to those. Were those done with any kind of co design, or did you all kind of you know, how did you curate those? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, so no, we, that was not a design process. That was more like Lauren and I came together um, and it was more of a literature review and brainstorming process amongst us where we looked across literature that um, was coming from a feminist perspective, but we tried to focus in particular, I would say on fields or practices that sort of tried to like operationalize feminism for lack of a better word so thinking about um how fields had applied feminism so looking at like feminist economics or like feminist human computer interaction uh feminist cartography and geography so think about like how do you like kind of put feminist principles into practice um and so that's that was sort of where that came from and we drew from there um so it's like yeah th those should be considered as like you know lauren and catherine's offering <laughs> in a sense um and and contingent because like even since we wrote the book like I, I, you know one of the things i feel like is absent from those principles is thinking about consent uh so thinking like consent is such a i mean we write a tiny bit about it but it's not a principle in the book um but consent practices are such a huge area of focus for, for feminist theory and activism. Um, and yet we talked about them very little. So, I mean, I think it's like, um, yeah, that's, that's how I would encourage us to, to think about them. Great. So um, we've got another question from um, Antonio. So I think we're going to, because it's nicer to hear people's voices after. <laughs> Um, Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, I think uh, around tension three, you talked a little bit about some of the tensions that came from at the institutional level. And I'm wondering if you can expand on that a little bit, particularly in terms of the participatory research process. And so kind of coming into these activist communities coming from institutions like MIT and I guess the tensions you face there, like were there incentives on the side of MIT that ran um, counter to those values and principles that you talked about? And particularly, like how did the activist groups kind of relate to you? And was there like mistrust at the beginning that you had to kind of move past? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, there, let's see, in terms of mistrust, um, you know, I think, we built trust over kind of these small engagements. So it's like at first we were more doing the qualitative research side. So we interviewed groups about their practices. Um, and nobody was mistrustful in that stage, I guess I would say. 
Um, but then by the point where we were inviting groups to participate in the pilot, I think they knew us. And, uh, you know, in the same, at the same time, we're also, as we're doing this work, um, part of the, the way that we think about it is I think like building also kind of social infrastructure and kind of offering things back to this community of practitioners. And so like that's both in the form of the tools that we're making, but like also in the form of the events that we're running and kind of opportunities for groups to collaborate with each other or meet each other. Um, because this was a strong thing that emerged even just in the first couple interviews that activists are already, already kind of like meeting each other and connecting with each other, but they're also really hungry for connecting with like-minded folks. So that's like a kind of side practice that was also happening as part of this, um, which I think also helped to build trust and um, yeah, I don't know, like kind of, again, offer something back instead of just like going in and like extracting some knowledge or something like this. Um, I've been careful about, um, yeah, the connection from MIT. Um, this is something I'm thinking about a lot um, because, and I've been very careful in trying to think about, this is why maybe I haven't like really talked about this work quite yet because I'm thinking about like how these kinds of stories get mobilized into these like hero stories. So this is like a, a convenient story for MIT to tell of like, you know, professor, makes a uh, socially useful technology or whatever. And so I've been kind of protective and not wanting to um, have MIT talk up on behalf of this project, if that makes sense. Um, and thinking about that relationship there. So, um, and then I think there's other institutional, um, institutional things as well, where it's like sort of simultaneously thinking about how to articulate, I mean, ultimately I, I am myself on the tenure track uh, at this institution and um, thinking about how collaborative work that um, I would consider to be in solidarity with activist work um, can be legible to the institution. Um, so trying to think about that and trying to think about how that, that um, structural <laughs> predilection <laughs> of the institution and the pressure that I might feel because of that, um, trying to have that not harm the project or harm the activists or harm kind of the relationships that we're building. Um, and I, I would say that's another tension, um, you know, and I, and I would point to um, one of the papers I cited that's about on activism in academia. Uh, where some of these tensions, I think, were addressed really well and in a really complex way, because I think there aren't there aren't easy answers, and um, the positionality is like definitely fraught, and we can't fall into easy again, like easy hero stories about ourselves or about others, really. Either. So. Great, thank you. So I, I've just realized the time, sorry, <laughs> I'm supposed to be the timekeeper. Um, are you okay to, there's a few more questions, Catherine. Um, I can say, yeah. Are you, are you okay to take them and we'll mm -hmm. try and stay on for a little bit longer, but yeah, recognizing that, you know, yeah, we all need to <laughs> maybe relax or, uh, you know, do other things. Um, so I think we've got Maurizio who wanted to ask yes, a question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Maurizio. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the talk. Well, it's very inspiring. My, my question relates to what you refer to as uh, tension three. Uh, so basically, continuity of these projects. You no, know? uh, um, and uh, because from a European perspective, from where I'm speaking, and also you know, some direct experience, what I've seen happening in Europe is that the model that is explored more often is you now building a kind of, uh, or supporting them, uh, this, what you call the community of practice, global community of practice in your uh, project. And then at some point the academic just you know, give up. You no, know? the software and infrastructure is donated or given to you know, associations or you know, some other, some, somebody who can take over because there is enough interest that you no know, somebody will provide labor or money to pay the labor that is needed for maintenance you no know? and um, and 
And it looked to me, listening to your presentation, that you had you had everything. No, you had no a network of. Uh, of um, organizations, you had no interest, visibility, you know, there, there was no, a lot of interest that tool you know, seemed to work. That is also another thing that, you know, not for everyone, as you know, pointed out clearly, but no, more or less for somebody uh, worked. So I'm wondering, you know, basically I have two, you know, one question that is nested into the other. One is if you have considered this model, you no, know, of you no, know, at some point, you no, know, becoming redundant as a researcher, stepping back and, and, and so on. And if no, why? And if yes, is it working? Is it not working? What, what, what does it work? And uh, yeah, I hope I've been clear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, in fact, um, it's, a, it's a great suggestion. And I, we actually have, we're gonna try to do like a retreat, Silvana and Elena and I, to talk about exactly kind of these questions around sort of next step. You know, we've been going for three years basically. And so to think about like, yeah, what is this, what is the next stage of this look like? Um, would we want to uh, try to have more community ownership or participation? You know, what would that look like? What are some of the barriers that activists face to like engage in that kind of work? Um, what were, what would be some of the technical and financial barriers to that? Could we figure out how to solve those though? Um, so yeah, we're, that's, that's on our agenda. And I would say, um, I think it's, it, it's definitely one of the possibilities. I mean, in particular, I like the idea, like, I really like the idea of a collaborative governance model for something like this, um, in which I liked your idea of the researcher becoming redundant, <laughs> right? So think about like, how do you like kind of um, seed something and maybe still contribute to it as like a network member or something like that, but like not necessarily need to be holding the center of it. Um, what makes it a little bit challenging is um, the technical know-how and infrastructure to keep that going. And, and so I think that's right. I'm getting stuck a little bit with my own thinking um, is because there are these costs of like who runs the servers, um, who fixes the bugs, who does the upgrades <laughs> to the database, uh, uh, who creates new machine learning models when we onboard new languages or something like that. So that's those are the things I'm thinking about. But um, but I, I like the kind of star, the north star of like the researcher becoming redundant. So uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I hope so. That's always my intention that I just become completely redundant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's such a great goal is like yeah. that you would fade out, <laughs> like, yeah. you know. <laughs> but I don't know. I feel like like tools, design things, artifacts, communities, like it's like all these things need care and feeding. And so like, yeah, yeah how yeah. can you like, like figure out how to institutionalize the care and feeding or cooperatize it or or something so yeah 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 absolutely um so we've got a few more questions if that's okay so um shana uh floor is yours thanks rachel and thank you catherine so much for this talk <clears throat> sorry um so I'm actually going to read what I wrote so that I don't go on and on and on. But so the first thing I wrote was thank you. And I think what the, the layers of reflection and analysis, both on process, but also on um, some of the things actually that Yoko raised in the chat about just sort of the nature of what the knowledge is that's being managed and, and thought about and, um, and used to you know, build these machine learning systems, I think is fascinating. Um, I come from um, work based in doing anti-prison work. And one of the things that is often really um, complicated in these kinds of data collection projects has to do with what comes next and thinking about sort of what the purpose of data collection is and how oftentimes, at least in a US context, data collection is sort of the, the first step toward um, dealing with things primarily through a criminal, sort of a criminalization um, lens, um, which is not to say in any way for clarity that I am saying that it is okay, the, the violence that is occurring. Rather, what I'm curious about is given these deep differences among organizers about how to ad address and end gender-based violence, 
especially with tensions between, you know, what people have called carceral feminism, so really a focus on hypercriminalization using data to support that, and on the other hand, people doing anti-violence work that is rooted in anti-carceral work. I'm curious about whether or how the project itself, Ariz, sort of created a floor or a platform or a space for these other political tensions to happen and maybe even bring organizations together that wouldn't normally be collaborating to do this other project. Um, but mostly I'm just curious, like what are the other political questions that this raises as you're already addressing these questions about use and about data and about information and language and positionality. Um, but thank you so much for, for this. Thanks. Um, yeah, th what you raise is so important. Um, and I would say, you know, it, it's, it's in the chapter that this talk is from, I actually talk a little bit about this because there's so many of the ways in which technology has been used to address gender violence are coming from these kind of carceral feminisms or like not even from any kind of feminism. It's like, it's more coming just from carcerality, I guess, right? Like just like not feminism. Um, as an example of that, um, I got a super troubling press release in my email inbox. I don't know why I received it, but I, it was from the company Honeywell. Um, so one day it just showed up and it was announcing this $60 million project that Honeywell is doing with the city of Bengaluru in India, where to address violence against women, they're installing a $60 million uh, command and control center for police <laughs> to surveil all the women. <laughs> and I was like, you know, so this is like the, this is maybe the example, <laughs> like the like pinnacle example of what you're talking about. Um, and I think represents, yeah, like a, often what is the um, response in particular like of the state when you say like, let's use technology or data to address gender-based violence, it comes with this lens of like, oh, okay, let's like fortify the police and uh, let's um, further, like give further money to the people who are actually not ensuring women's safety um, and so on. And so I was like, when they saw that press release, I was thinking like, well, what kind of, a better world would have happened if you gave sixty million dollars to like the on the ground grassroots women's and feminist groups who are probably actually um, helping people uh, navigate this kind of violence. But um, so all that's not necessarily to answer your question, but just to say that like I think it's a really important uh, counterpoint to be cognizant of as like as like I mean we're trying to support folks who are doing this from the grassroots and generally speaking, um, the ways in which they're using, they do, um, they are, there are a number who are working towards uh, legal reform, um, but these are conversations that are happening in kind of broader feminism is like how much, when we, when we talk about gender-based violence, like how much are we talking about endorsing this, this approach of criminalization versus um, community protection or community self-defense, which is where a lot of these grassroots groups are, are situated. Um, not all, but a lot. Um, but so, but so yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think that's a good prompt to be, um, maybe again, thinking about that space of like where the data go and what happens with the data, which I didn't really talk about, um, but it's, it's quite diverse how activists use and circulate their data. It's not just this like, numbers counting for the sake of having numbers or something like that. Um, and so I think those are definitely conversations that kind of are happening, not in our, not by us, but like they are happening more broadly in the space, but like we could be mobilizing those conversations potentially more too. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the question, Shana. Um, and we've got a couple more, I think. Um, there's somebody posted an anonymous question, so I'll I'll read it out if that's okay. Um, so thanks again for a, such a wonderful talk. I noticed that the initiatives you talked about have low involvement of men, which makes sense given the topics being worked on. I'm curious, what is your or your collaborators' view on the role of men, if any, in the incredible work you are all doing around feminicide? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think 
you know, as with many things, like this is primarily women's work. It's either women led or queer led. Um, and then for groups that monitor racialized forms of feminicide, it's led by women of color. Um, and, I, you know, I think that's how it should be. Um, and yeah, I think what would be great to see is potentially more men um, working on the side that, um, you know, there's, there's like, it takes more than one gender to create <laughs> gender-based violence, <laughs> right? So like, um, so thinking about like, how do you work on the side of gender-based violence that is that um, sort of toxic masculinity side? And there are really amazing groups um, led by men that are, are working on that side. I don't know in particular like data activist groups that are working like that data and technology space, but um, there's a lot of work um, in, various communities to think about like kind of what's the healthy role for men? Um, how do we work with boys and men um, to not overvalue toxic masculinity, um, to uh, think about what does uh, gender quality look like and so on and so forth. So I think like um, as with all sort of struggles of oppression, like there is a role for both the groups that are oppressed and the groups that are the oppressors, quote unquote. Um, and so I would just encourage men to find that role um, because you can play a really strong role um, in that effort, even if you're not like the data activist at the center of the data activism project or something, so yeah. Yeah, great. I think that's one of the questions that I've seen in, you know, there's such a, so many projects with women where women continue to do the labor when they're also you know, considered the victims and you know so um and so there has been a shift in at least in british um processes where you know there's some there's work to be done by um perpetrators of violence um mm -hmm. yeah i think i've got colleagues who are also looking at how that is also you know still very unequal in the justice system in the way that's um managed so yeah Sure, um, sure. So I think we've got one more question and then we'll um, tie up if that's okay. So I think uh, Lily's come back, so she went and then she's back. Um, and I think she's with us again now, great. Do you wanna ask your question, Lily? Sure, thank you so much for the chance to be with this work, um, it's amazing. Uh, my question was about you know, what, like kind of, you know, like there's a lot of different feminist practices and histories uh, in different geographies and different groups that are, you know, facing different kinds of issues. And so like what kinds of, um, like what kinds of reflections or learning did you find kind of coming as a North American feminist um, with your own histories and then in, in coming to work with Latin American feminist movements? Like, you know, there are observations about like places where there were easier alignments or there were like disalignments that have lessons for feminism up um, maybe at least in North America where you and I both live. Totally. And hi, Lily, thank you for coming. Hi. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, part of this was um, I, being, so impressed by the strength of the Latin American feminist movement right now. I mean, it's a really incredible, um, it's a really incredible thing. And the what's happened with Neo and Amenos um, since 2015 is kind of the first Neo and Amenos uprising happened where it's like literally hundreds of thousands of people turned out in the, the streets to protest um, following um, sort of two uh, really, um, sort of terrible murders of young women and in Argentina in particular. But, um, and so I think there's actually so many lessons <laughs> that North American feminists can learn. Um, you know, one of the strong things that was present in a good amount of the groups that we interviewed in Latin America was a really strong linking of this violence with uh, economic violence. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's a kind of critique. I mean, like, of course, like anti-capitalist feminism, of course, exists in North America as well, but it was 
was really prevalent and like a kind of um, movement oriented way. So like, for example, uh, there's this one group in Argentina called Mumala that they um, have chapters all over the country. They work a lot with young people, they're movement building sort of chapter based organization um, and just have a really strong component of linking gender violence um, to economic violence. And there's like, they have a whole kind of um, pedagogy around that. Um, and so I think that for me was, um, you know, much more in a way like much more a, a popular uh, sort of way of approaching it than it is in at least the way of I've experienced it in North America, which is it's more has been more of like a thing from academia and less from, I mean, of course it exists in like there are anti-capitalist movements, but has less has been less of a popular thing. Um, I would also say there's, it's not to minimize the tensions between sort of feminism and trans feminism or queer approaches and so on, but there was a lot more, I would say, solidarity, even forged through differences um, that I felt like I was witness to um, in some of these movement spaces when I was there at least, um, where there's folks having disagreements about like whether or not a particular protest or march is being like that's for feminism or women's march or women like the international women's day march which is always a big deal um so there were like debates about whether um sort of lgbtq uh, trans travesty people are going to be included in those um but ultimately those groups all showed up and they arrived at an agreement where uh, folks were included and showed up for each other um and so that to me was also a really encouraging um, sort of thing. Um, and then I think the whole discourse around um, colonialism and imperialism is like much, obviously much more present there than in the United States where like we are the <laughs> colonial <laughs> imperial power. Um, and so I think that too is like, it's, it's again a kind of more nuanced and um, interesting access to bring into a feminist analysis that's not always present um, here when we're talking about uh, feminism in North America. Thanks, Catherine. That's, um, again, this, there's a, a wonderful connection be between where we, in 2020, when we did um, PDC, it was supposed to be in Colombia, and so the influence of Latin American activists and um, participatory action research and those kind of influences were very present. So I think your work is a, an amazing connection to, to that um, commitment as well. So um, thank you. So we'll stop it there before, <laughs> before we, um, you know, ring Catherine dry with all these questions, but thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I think it's just a testament to how um, amazing the work is and but also just to hear you talk about some of the uh, challenges and tensions um, and share those with you, you know, pre before you you, you finish the chapter off. Um, so thank you so much. I don't know whether those of us that can put our um, we can clap. We're clapping in the office here. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not quite the same as a big auditorium. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, we'll just do a, for those of us still in the room, because a lot of people have disappeared off. Um, in the UK, it's Friday evening, so a lot of people, and, and in Europe, so a lot of people will be going off to party, be with family. Um, so we'll just give an overview um, of next week. So those of you who are with us, so um so we switched to being uh primarily in newcastle but also running hybrid sessions um so we have the weekend off well some people have the weekend off some of us have to prepare for next week um bank holiday is a monday um sorry monday is a bank holiday um so the building if you're on your way to newcastle the building won't be open on monday there will be uh, volunteers doing um organizing things and some of us will be heading off to Hadrian's Wall so that one of the biggest infrastructures of I guess we, we don't call it colonial power but definitely of empire um, that eventually tumbled so um, we're heading up up to the Northumberland um, border of, of Scotland um, and then on 
Monday we have um, our workshop. So all of those are hybrid workshops. Workshops. So we have um, phenomena, uh, co-design of the Plurreversal Commons, model canvas, making together across space and time, creative entrances to co-design, shared endeavors, exploring Eleanor Ostrom's principles for collaborative group working. Um, we've got Phenomena again, that's co-designing pl planetary care through joy, so two sessions there. And then the final one of the day, justice-oriented participatory electronic textile making. Um, so that's on Tuesday, the 30th of August. And then we've also got some really exciting situated actions. So we've got a session called Pass the Parcel, visualising environmental action across global sites, and that'll be a walk. Uh, neating, sharing the table, crafting knowledge, which will be over in um, what we call Shieldfield, which is where our exhibition is. Open Forest, Data Stories and Walking With, which is um, a walk, a data walk. Um, so we're not running co-creating a virtuous cycle, so that needs to go, actually, we've had to cancel that one. But then we've got an ex exhibition opening, buffet and drinks reception at Shieldfield Artworks. So thank you once again for joining us, whether you've you know, joined us just for today or for throughout the conference. And some of these, or most of these sessions are um, hybrid. So you, if you're joining us online next week, then we will see you there. Or we'll see you in Newcastle. So thank you, everyone.